Okay, in the latest of our coaching corner with Stephen Poacher, we're going to talk about how you make use of half time. Stephen, it's obviously a crucial it's a crucial time for a management team and for the players because you can really turn around what's happened in the first half, especially if things have gone back poorly. Yeah, Shane, listen, there's no doubt about it. And, you know, from, from experience, uh, both watching games and watching different types of experiences and also being involved in them, you know, you understand that half time can it can win or lose you a game. It really can, you know, and it's probably an area, Shane, that's that's never really been explored. You know, we, we probably, we talk about so much of of coaching and we talk about elements of game plans and tactical awareness and switches in games, but that's that's a 15-minute segment that you're in total control of and that you can prepare for, you know, so it is vitally important. And I suppose, Shane, you know, traditionally and historically in the past, we've, we've heard all the stories, you know, the, the Joe Kernan one in 2002 against Kerry of, throwing the medal against the wall and, you know, other other types of, of, of team talks in the past, you know, the, the Ferguson hairdryers and then you have the, the Rafa Benitez in 2005 where Steven Gerrard and Carragher said that tactically, you know, he, he made so many shrewd changes and next door uh, in the Milan change rooms, you know, by all accounts, they were, they were nearly drinking champagne, you know, celebrating. So halftime can, it can take on a hugely important part of the game and, and if you probably think of it, it it's probably the most important part of it because if you react at halftime and you change something at halftime, it doesn't allow the opposition time to, to, to readjust. And I always remember speaking to, to the likes of Tony Buckley about this and some of the coaches at the very high end of our game. And I remember him saying to me, he said, like, if you make a change at halftime, the opposition, or if you spring a surprise or make a change, the opposition don't really have time to react. It takes them five, 10 minutes to work out what you've done. And then it'll take five or 10 minutes for a readjustment. And then you're into that last phase where everything's out the window anyway. It's doggy dog stuff for the last 10 minutes, you know. So it, it's a really interesting one. Whereas if you spring a surprise at the start of the game, it allows a, a team an opportunity then to fix that and rejig, you know. Mickey Hart's a great man for, for making changes at halftime, uh, Shane. You know, I remember even going back to playing against Tyrone 10 years ago with the down under 21s. I remember Peter Hart playing at, at centre half back, and or sorry, centre half forward, apologies. And Paul McPoland from Hilltown actually was marking him at centre half back. And Taz was having a fantastic game. Uh, he was winning break ball. He was driving forward. And Hart was completely out of the game. And I think we were three, four points up at half time. It was the third replay, actually. It was three phenomenal games of football. The first game in Dury was a draw. The second game in Omo was a draw after extra time. And then the third game in the Athletic Grounds, down were three points up at half time. And Remy Mulgrew was the throw manager. And they came out in the second half. And I just remember looking around real quickly and seeing that Hart had moved from 11 to 6. And I thought, I'm happy enough with that, you know, because we thought Hart, obviously, is a class act. And we thought, closer to our goal, he's going to harm us. But Paul was having, Paul McPullen from Hilton was having that good an influence in game and, and the game. You know, we left him at 6. But then he picked up a different type of player. Hart started to influence the game from 6. And they turned the game on the head and they won by 4, you know. And it's an interesting one. And that move won them the game. It won them the game, you know. So... Half time is it's such a crucial, crucial part of the game, and you know I, I've made mistakes at half time. Uh, you know I, I've, I've I've made really good changes, but it's about learning as well. And I think one of the things I'm gonna reference it now in a second is is I remember coming across a, a document uh, on on Twitter a while back about the five hours, and it made me think about half time. But uh, one of the things Shane that we had an issue with uh, with the club was we were coming out too early for the second half. So what we decided to do, and a few of the players came to me, so Stevie, we need to do something at half time because we're coming out too early. So what I actually done at done at Carlo from the very first game, win, lose or draw, no matter how the half was going, we just had a small congregation of coming together in a small huddle before we went in, Shane. And there was no agenda about it. There was no, it wasn't like look at us, we're doing something different. All we were simply doing was letting the opposition go in, and it was giving us an extra minute or two just to let the lads calm and relax and bring the heart rates down. And you can actually see in some of the games that we played, I was looking back on some of our games there recently, actually, because I was looking for some coaching videos to, to sort of cut and, and, and look at uh, during this time of, of, of isolation, you know, giving ourselves something to do. And I remember looking at a lot of half times, particularly the key games and championship games against Dublin's and Kildare's and things like that. And you can actually see in the huddle a number of players and myself doing this sort of image, you know, let's just calm down. We bring the players in. They relax. We say, right, go in and relax and refuel, you know, and you're wondering probably where I got those words from, relax and refuel. Well, there's, there's, there's a lovely image that, that I'm sure you, you might want to share with people there. It's, it's the five R's 
of a half-time team talk. Just before you and, do, uh, can, can I just ask yeah, you yeah. one thing? How much of an emphasis, and I presume this ties into the five hours, you've talked about trying to make those switches at halftime and then 10 minutes into the second half, you've figured out what you need to do to address what the opposition has decided to do. You're trying to give instructions then to players who not only are they running around and fatigued, but their blood is up, their, their thinking probably isn't clearly as well. So I presume that's, that's a big issue with trying to make changes on the fly during a half. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about it. And I think, I think Shane, it's, it's probably important as well that if you, if you have a player who's aroused, uh, you know, who, who's, who's physically aroused with the game, who's emotionally involved in the game, and you're going in with the, the fist pump and, and the banging walls, that's going to get that player into a state of, you know, frantic nature. It's going to get them into a state where they're not thinking clearly. And I think that's why it's important. And we'll see later, in, in when we talk about some of the player testimonies, we'll see that later. Where a lot of players who I've spoken to in professional sport in, in, uh, in our own game at the highest level who have all said that it's so important that there's no banging walls, there's no banging tables. You know, they want a clear message and they want a calm message, Shane, you know? So let's move into the five hours. I'm just going to bring them up on screen as you talk here. Yeah. Yeah, so if you look at them, well, the first thing, relax and refuel. I'm sure any players that are, that are listening or who have worked with me will, will have heard this drum down their throats for the last number of years and it's just something that I would have always said and got into the chase at half time. You know, right man, relax and refuel. And there might have been a contentious issue. Two players might be falling out with each other over something. You know, you're not picking my man up or, you know, or you didn't track him. And you're just saying, lads, nobody, just relax and refuel. Don't worry about talking. Just bring the bodies back down. And I think relaxing is probably the first thing, Shane, that is vitally important, you know. And you see the brain on the image there, you know, and, and the, the brain and the, and the lungs and the heart rate. And it's just about bringing the heart rate down because if you think, if you think clearly, and I suppose, you know, I think back to, to Cormac Venny, sports psychologist that was chatting to me about him earlier there. Cormac came into our school a number of years ago and he'd done a little thing about exam techniques with the kids. So he got them to do an exercise. But before they'd done the exercise, they did one minute of high intensity um, aerobics, like stepping on a chair. So what they were doing was they were increasing their heart rates. And it was a simple little number exercise where you had to sort of spot a number or whatever or do a little calculation. I can't remember the exact little uh, exercise you had them doing. But when the, when the kids sat down after the heart rate's elevated, they had 30 seconds to work this little problem out on the sheet. And most of them couldn't do it, you know, because their heart rate was elevated. They, were, they weren't thinking clearly. So what he done was then for five minutes, he done breathing techniques with them in through the nose, out through the mouth. He got them to relax. He got them to bring their heart rate down. Then he fired out a different little sheet. So a similar exercise. Bang, 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 within 10, 15 seconds, they all had it done. You know, it was a very clear example of how you don't think clearly and how you're too emo too emotionally involved, you know, when your heart rate is elevated and, and you're too high. So this, this opportunity to relax, you know, and just get the players to breathe correctly, you know, just helps them to take information on board, Shane, that's vitally important, you know. And the other thing about that goes hand in, in, in time that is the refueling. You know, you want players to refuel as quickly as possible. Because if they're refueling at the end of halftime, they're going out into the second half and maybe feel a little bit bloated, a little bit heavier. Whereas if they're refueling at the start, because let's be honest, most half times now, particularly at the highest level, nearly 20 minutes. And TV might dictate that, that it could be 20 minutes, you know. So, But at club level, you're probably talking half time probably will give or take between 10 and 20 minutes, you know, depending on... I, I, I've, I've waited on some teams for 25 minutes, but the uh, but but half time 10, 10, 20 minutes. So it's important that they get the fluids on board straight away. Shane, cost effective. I, I was very fortunate to sit in some really high performance change rooms in the past in, in rugby as well. And you know, you see them type of change rooms where you see you know real sort of like high high energy gels and the, the expensive stuff, if you want to call it, you know, and, and the, the, the caffeine chewing gum or whatever, whatever players like to take, and certain players will bring their own stuff. But at club level, you can do simple things like jelly babies or sugary foods or, or whatever. And, you know, and I'll tell a famous story, actually, uh, from years ago. Um, I remember doing a bit of coaching about, oh, about 13 years ago, 14 years ago with Damian Barton from Derry. And uh, it was before a championship game and down, and this was the famous Pavlova story. So he, he wanted to order Pavlovas for the Burn team for half time in the chase rooms, you know, and uh, won the first two championship games. And I'm not telling you a word of a lie. This is a true story. This is a true story. It made the back page of the Irish news and uh, won the first two championship games. Pavlova, perfect. There was no fresh cream or mad stuff on it, but there were the base of a Pavlova and a bit of fruit, whatever. And uh, 
the problem was trying to get some boys back out for the second half of this beautiful Pavlova from the Shelburne. But in the semi-final, in the semi-final of the championship, they were beaten by Lock and Island. It was a bit of a shock. They were beaten by a point. Lock and Island scored three freak goals, you know, and someone found a, a half tray of Pavlova as they were sweeping the Chasums up at the end from a rival club. And this photograph then appeared and, you know, and the boys were eating Pavlova at half time. So I, I got awful abuse about that, but I, I just want to go on record here now, 14 years later, and say it wasn't my idea, it was Barton's, you know. But uh, so I, I've seen I've seen it all when it comes to refueling, uh, Shane, you know, I've seen it all. Uh, but uh, but listen, simple little things, you know, chopped oranges for underage teams, you know, anything that just gives the players a little bit of sugar or gives them that little bit of glucose, which is obviously going to help them, you know, in, in the second half. And particularly on warm days as well, I think it's vitally important that they're, that they're rehydrating, you know. Um, but but uh, listen, those two things are, are, are pretty straightforward and pretty simple, Shane. Uh, but it's it's probably the next phase of the five hours that, that, that is crucially important. Crucially important. important, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So you take us through those, so there's relax, review and refocus. Yeah, well, I think reflect is, is very important. Now, reflect can take on a number of the ways, okay? The reflect in the first half can be, I think it's important that the players have time to reflect. I think that's very important. And that will obviously come maybe just after the relaxation phase where, you know, they're sitting together as a group. And that's why I don't like to go into the chasers straight away. I always like to stand outside for two or three minutes with the selectors, you know, with with the... And listen, I've worn all the hats. I've been a selector. I've been a coach. I've been a manager. And I do like to have that two, three minutes where you just clear your thoughts. Maybe stay, if you have a stats man, you know, you speak to the stats man. And let's be honest, if you're getting cleaned out in the middle of the field, you know, you really should be able to say that yourself. You know, you probably don't need a stats man to come along and say, Stevie, you know, it's 14 6 on break ball. You know, I think you can probably see that if you, if you know, if you're watching the game closely, you can see maybe that midfield's an area that needs addressed, or if you have a cornerback who's in trouble. But you're very reliant on the stats man being able to give you a very clear, concise, co- just a, a succinct message for you and why, so that you can then pass it on to the players. Yeah, and I think players like stats, Shane. I think players like to see them. Uh, I've seen Ray Boyne on Twitter there recently put up a thing, and it was a great idea. Actually, it's something that we would have done anyway in the past, where he, he had a whiteboard in the Dublin chase rooms, and when he went in at half time, after the players were settled, he walks in and he writes the stats on the board. You know, key stats like maybe turnover counts, uh, wides. Shooting efficiency, uh, yeah. Turnovers, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, 50-50 yeah, yeah. balls. Yeah, just the important stuff, you know, the important stuff that players and players can see that. And I think it's important because if they were on the wall already before the players are sitting in the cheese rooms, a lot of them probably won't even look at it. But when someone comes in and starts to write, everyone's attention then is going to be geared towards that, you know. But that reflect, Shane, I think it's important that the players do have time to reflect among themselves before the, the, the management team come in to reflect, you know. And I think that, that that's vitally important. And then obviously the review, the review, obviously, you know, I think. If, if you're the, the two are very much in tandem, put it like this to reflect the review. But if you're reviewing the half, and I've always I found this Shane funny, I've found this uh, from from experience in the past that when you try to review a game from the naked eye, you miss an awful lot. You miss an awful lot. And when you actually go back to a video and watch the video clips of the first half, or sorry, of, of the game, and you then compare that to what your naked eye was thinking, it's unbelievable. Now, we were, we were very fortunate, at Carlo, that straight after the game, before you got onto the team bus, there was a, a link to YouTube on the WhatsApp group from John Farrell, the, the, the video analysis man, who was fantastic. And John had the link in straight away, and you could see the game straight away as you were travelling home or whatever, you know, that evening. But at club level, I didn't have that luxury. So I might not have got the video till, say we played on a Friday, I might not have got the video till a Sunday or a, or a Monday. And by the time it comes to Sunday or Monday, You've gone over a certain certain period or a certain uh, incident, and you've blamed Shane Stapleton on it. And I said, "See Stapleton, he was he was wrong there." And you're saying to the management team, and then you go back and you go, "Did you Shane had a great game?" You know, you, you actually forget certain things, and you actually nearly because the naked eye is very hard to see. So I think when you're reviewing the first half, Shane, I think it's important that you take views on board, listen to your st- your stats man, listen to your management team. You know, don't go in on your own accord and say what happened in that goal. That was your fault, or you know, because you're not you're not thinking clearly, and it's very hard for the naked eye to remember and recall everything. Yeah, because you're probably making emotive decisions based on your own point of view, which might not exactly be the most clear thinking because your blood is up as well. 
Correct. That's absolutely correct. And that's why, and, and listen, there's nobody gets their blood up more at football matches than me, I can tell you. But that's why I use that time at half time just to sort of even just bring myself down, calm, take those two or three minutes. And, and I, I say very little when we meet as a management team or working in at half time. I, I actually, the actual words I say is, talk to me, man. That's what I say. I just say, talk to me. And I'm taking their thoughts on board. I'm thinking my own thoughts and I'm reflecting on everything, you know. And I think that that's, that's an important part, Shane, you know. And listen, we're all not blessed with this, but a crucial part of the review of the first half, and I'll speak about it later in, in, in when we talk about my own experience at rugby, real-time video. So I, I was watching a game where Dublin played Roscommon last year and in the championship in the Super 8s, I think it was, and Jim Yadwin is looking at an iPad rather than the game, you know, and it was very, very interesting. Like he's obviously, he's reviewing an incident in real time. You know, he's reviewing an incident 20 minutes into the game that happened five minutes ago and the game's going ahead in front of him. Like, a lot of people don't have that luxury or that access to that. And I am sure, Shane, and I could be wrong, uh, but I am sure that Dublin are definitely getting video clips at halftime. I'm sure of it. You know, I, I'm sure they are. I'm sure real top sides are at that level now because that's one of the differences I've seen from professional sport to our sport, which technically still is amateur, is that at the professional level, it was the analysis that really struck out for me. And, you know, you, the backs and the forwards in Ravenhill that evening, I'll chat about it later in greater depth because we're talking about the five hours here, but the backs would go to one side, the forwards go to the other, two iPads in the middle of them, video clips, our line needs to be higher here, our first point of contact, whatever the rugby terminology is, you know. So it's something I would love to do at Gaelic. It's something I would love to have at Gaelic and access to, but, you know, yourself, in, a, in an ideal world, we would all be running around with iPads on the sideline, you know? Yeah, because I, I watch an awful lot of American football, and that's definitely something that you'd see in between plays that, let's say, the quarterback or whatever, go and sit on the bench. He's then looking at clips, talking it over with the coach. Another thing that comes to mind is you're saying that Dublin might have, uh, for example, Dublin might have access to video footage that they're giving to Jim Gavin. I remember watching the Limerick Hurlers during the 2018 season when they, of course, went on to win the All-Ireland. Now, they lost by 11 points to Clare down in Cusick Park in... Oh, it wasn't a make or break game in the last round of Munster. But what I saw them doing, setting up before the start of the game, was one camera facing, like in the middle of the stand, one camera facing to that side of the field, one camera facing to that side of the field, because they obviously wanted to be analy analysing clips of, let's say, forward movement, back movement, how they were setting up, this sort of stuff. So that's obviously crucial. And we're obviously going back to how you adjust things at half time, but maybe there is a tie in there. But one other point you made that I found very interesting is you wanted the players to talk to you. I would say that there could be a danger then of the same players giving you confirmation bias at half time that it's always the same lads talking, they're always giving it from their Michael Jordan S point of view, you know, that they are the main men and everyone else are role players. Do you ever have a concern about getting the getting the messages just from a couple of players who are very much reinforced in how they want the game structured around them rather than actually the holistic full team view? I, I funny you should say that because I remember years ago and uh I think the, the Kingdom boys would know who I'm talking about, but I'd say, if, if I had said to the Enrique team, uh, you know, talk to me, M Marty Clark would give you a good laugh on this. I know Marty would probably know who I'm talking about, but if there was certain players started to speak, you would nearly have to give them a time limit. You know, look, we only have 15 minutes. But no, but on a serious note, Shane, I'd be very I'd be very discreet and shrewd about it. And for example, I take Bally Holden, for example, their current senior manager is now Damien McCrink. Damien was full back for me as a player, you know, and I knew that his point would be valid. It would be important. So I would say, talk to me, Damien, what do you see straight away? You know, so you're, 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 you're giving the players the opportunity to feedback, but strategically, you're picking the players who you want to be given that feedback to, you know. And then there was natural leaders as well in, in the team. And there's natural leaders. And Carlo was exactly the same. You know, certain players, particularly players who had a coaching hat on them, you know, the likes of Daniel Seledger there, maybe Sean Ganning, players, Paul Broderick, whatever, Brendan Murphy, players, senior players who've been around 10, 12 years, who had seen it all, who could who could who could see it from different elements of the game? You know, if you have a full back who can see out the field, if you have a full forward who's looking up the field, you know, the full forward can see that 11's dropping too deep. Stevie, with no link at eleven, you know, we're just dropping a little bit too deep, and it's not a criticism of eleven. You know, he's just trying to fix something that maybe we haven't spotted. You know, and and it could be something simple. It could be something very very simple, Shane, uh, that the players see or the players hear. You know, the players could hear a call from their kickers that we maybe can't see. You know, and I think that that's vitally important as well. But you're completely right. Be careful when you, if you do think about it, opening up the room. I would never open up the room because what you could have then is a, 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 a debate. 
you know, it could be a forward blaming the defender or a defender blaming the forward. And you don't want it to turn into a blame game. You want it to be two, two or three key points. And we'll see that later on, actually, when we look at some of the testimonies from some of the players who I, I collaged information from. And we'll see, actually, how some player or some teams actually nominate leaders within the group to actually feed back to the management team, which is an interesting one. But there's one last point there, Shane, in the, in the five hours, and that's the refocus. And I think that that's vitally important, you know, because when you're sitting there and you're relaxing and you're reviewing the half, you do need to get back up again, you know, because it's a new half. I always see the second half as a new game, you know. So, you know, most teams give a rousing speech at the start of the game. And it's not about giving a rousing speech, but I do think you need a little form of get the heart rate back up now. We don't want players going out sleeping. We don't want players going out lax. So let's just get a wee bit of adrenaline going. So the refocus might be two or three key points again, nothing more, because if you start getting into four, five, six points, you're lost, you're gone. Players at that stage are only going to take one or two key things in, Shane, even key words. And what I like to do is I like to have an A1 sheet in the change rooms, and I like to have two or three key points on it. And I would just even just refer to them before we go back out again, just a quick reinforcement or fix something that the opposition are doing, you know, and maybe just try and fix it. And, And I think the important thing there is that when you do, go out for the start of the second half, there is a some little form of motivation as well. You know, whether it might be just a, a couple of words, it might be something that strikes a chord with them. You know, it might be just a quick huddle, whatever it happens to be. An interesting one for you. Some players have talked about a mini warm-up before the second half. It's an interesting one because some people start the second half flat. And I, and I always wonder why after 15 minutes, you know, we would never do a mini warm-up because really and truly, if we're going to approach games with a 15-minute break, should we not be integrating that into our training sessions? Should we not be training for 30, 40 minutes, having a break for 10 minutes, not necessarily a break, but having some form of, of, of stoppage in the training which simulates players restarting again then, Shane? Do you know what I mean? You know, Because training sessions normally last for 50, 60 minutes. And the way coaching has gone now, the training is 100 mile an hour. It's game to game to game to game to game. There's no stoppages. There's no, And that's the way players like it, don't get me wrong. But maybe we should incorporate that into training it's worth thinking you know mm, yeah i like that it's a very interesting idea is it something that you you've looked at doing yeah well listen it's something probably that would happen now and again in training anyway you know a typical training session for me shane anyway would start with a warm-up then we'd go into some structured games uh, after a little bit of skill refinement but i would say at different times in the games we might stop for a little quick break now if we're playing 15 v 15 at county level for example uh something that we would have done with the county minors pre-christmas when we, were, when, we were, when we were doing a little bit of training, was uh, in-house games. So we're playing a bit of in-house games, and one group would go with, with uh, Mark and, and Daniel, and one group would go with me and James or something, and we would chat them for three or four minutes on a tactics board. Maybe we want you to do this, et cetera, and then they'll go back out and play again. But we wouldn't have probably gone to the extent of stopping for 10 minutes and restarting again. But maybe that's something further on down the line that we can look at. I remember somebody talking in... Uh, one of the coaching conferences, Shane, that I done, or sorry, one of the coach conferences that I was that I was attending uh, a good a good while back, and they talked about how they felt players in Crow Park, for example, or places that you have access to a warm up area, might actually start performing little mini warm ups, you know, before they go back out again, you know. So it is an interesting one. Absolutely. So you've spoken to a couple of different players um, about half time. So you, do you want to go through a couple of player testimonies? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll get fire those up. Well, the first the first player testimony, obviously player confidentiality. They were happy to let their names go forward, but uh, you know some of them might be in trouble, maybe giving away secrets in the camp. But this is from a, from a, a current player uh, within Ulster, uh, plays playing inter county football within Ulster. You look at the couple of points are just you know let the team sit together for a few minutes to our thoughts, not interested in ranting or raving or long drawn out talking. Uh, only one person talking, two or three key points. And I, lo- I love this little, his exact words were a little bit of hairdryer treatment if needed. And that, that message came with a smiley face. But like, it, it's an interesting one because if you actually look at it, it nearly reflects you in the five hours. You know, the relax and refuel, you know, the review, the two or three key points, and then the refocus, the hairdryer, you know. So it is an interesting one. If we look at player B, uh, this is from a player in, in, uh, in Leinster, uh, a current inter-county player in Leinster. You know, allow time to relax. And, and by the way, I just want to put on record, these players would have got no um, guidance from me on the five hours, if that makes sense. So they would have, they wouldn't have seen the five hours sheet, you know. So in case people think that they're that, that, that these are things, so it's not a coincidence 
the players were talking about that time to relax. So there's two players talking about emotion, relax, bring it down. Three points again. You know, this is coming from a player. I like this word though, Shane. A roadmap. You know, map it out the direction we want to go in the second half. That's very interesting. Very interesting to hear, you know, that the players, players like direction, don't they? You know, so it's it's important. That, and then, very interesting again, the very final point, a kick in the arse if needed. You know, so so they, they, they do respond to that, you know, but I, I think I think players are at the situation now, though, Shane, that they, they've been exposed to so so much good coaching, uh, such good analysis that this coming in and banging walls and uh, throwing things against the wall, I, I don't think it works. It might work as a one-off or the odd time, but I, I don't think it is the way forward if, if we look at, at, at the other testimonies. Player C, as a former inter-county footballer, um, you know, player-led. This is an interesting one. I really, I, I, I thought deeply about this one. So player-led responsibility. And in small groups, defenders and forwards together, feedback via leader to management. So that's an interesting one. Getting into smaller groups, sharing ideas, because maybe players don't want to speak Shane in front of the whole group, whole group, you know. Uh, manager takes time to reflect. That's an important that's an important one because if a manager doesn't take that time to reflect and go straight in, as you say, his emotions could be just as high as a player, and something might be said that that that, that could be forget. Now this is this is a, this is a key thing as well, I feel. No negativity from management uh, in their terminology as players know themselves. You know, keep the message positive. So you're looking at no negativity, positivity. And that's an interesting one, you know, because negative, sometimes, Shane, if you say something negative, it's a bit like the kids. It's a bit like the kids in school or the children in school. They might not always remember what you say, but they'll always remember how the words made you feel. So if you're saying something negative, a player could feel you know that negative energy you know what's what's important but isn't there a balance to be found between you know i mean obviously you want to be as positive as possible but there's times when a guy is coasting through a game or he's not doing the job he's been given so it's still ga it's still competitive sport you're not talking about 30 snowflakes on the field at the same time so there's a balance <laughs> to be found yeah yeah and listen you know i suppose maybe a change of wording you know uh like i i go back to the teaching hat you know and a I don't want to sound like a real school teacher, but it's the two stars and a wish, you know. So you're giving them a the little bit of positivity. Look, Shane, you're going really well. You kicked a great point. But Shane, you remember that he went down the line that time? You just need to tighten up on tracking a runner, you know. So you're giving them a the little bit of positivity, but feeding them with that little key point as well. I think going in and criticising the player directly, and, and listen, don't get me wrong, sometimes they probably do need called out, but maybe the Monday night of training is the time for doing that. You know, not at half time when you need that player maybe to perform in the second half. You know, uh, but and, and and it's an interesting one where where this guy says, well, this player says, a player knows themselves. So so maybe you know, but look, look, this is where I make the point, Shane, about coaching. You need to get to know your players as people, not just as players, because if you know that person and you know he responds to a kick in the arse, or you know he responds to a come on, he'll do that. But if he responds to a little arm around the shoulder, a little hug, a little bit of delicacy. That's how you approach it. You know what I mean? You know, and it, it, it's, it's, I used to get a bit of stick because the boys would say to me, uh, some of the Carlo boys would say to me, they'd say, like, you're a deadly man because you would cut us in two and then you'd be over high five us. And we sort of be, would be giving you the high five even though we'd want to punch you. You know, so the, uh, so it's about, it's, it's about a bit of tough love. It's about a bit of tough love, I suppose, you know, and, and trying to find that balance, you know. Um, this, this last testimony, uh, Player D from, it's professional sport. And I like this because, their half is broken down into three thirds, Shane. So the first third is the recovery time, uh, space to themselves, uh, time to cool down, re refuel. Uh, it's, it's an interest, you know, as the first man to mention refuel and have a quick personal reflection. You know, players probably need that time themselves to actually reflect on their own performance before they start thinking about the team performance, you know. Um, the second third, a tangible reinforcement of what is going well, preferably through stats, visual or video. So you can see there, Shane, the difference in professional and amateur. You know, that there's a professional sports person telling me that they want their stats through through video, you know, or, or, or visual. Um, if the opposition are on top, a plan to counteract them. And then the final third, a little motivational stuff from a different voice and a mini warm-up lasting one or two minutes. So there's a, there's, there's a nice, uh, interesting view from a professional sports chain, you know. And, and it's interesting that the half has been broken into 
in the three thirds there, and maybe gives us food for thought at GA, you know. Because the the flip side then is not every person uh, responds too well to to this much structure, and someone who's gone well because they're just going out there and letting it flow and just thinking that all of this might have a, a counterproductive effect on them. Is that something that you have to consider? Yeah, there's no doubt. There's no doubt because and and it's a bit like the warm up as well. You know, like some players like the warm up. In, in a lax type of way and you sort of just you sort of turn a blind eye to that I like my warm-ups at 100 mile an hour I, I like the warm-ups to set the tone Shane I always say warm-ups set the tone for a good session warm-ups possibly set the tone for a good game uh, you know you nearly get a feeling in the warm-up Shane you nearly get a feeling but sometimes that player who's got his head in his hands that player who's holding on your every word you know players are different and it'll take you a while to understand that and, and to know your players, you know. And you can't have everyone sitting like meerkats, you know, sitting up, looking at you, focused on you. As long as people, if you're if you're addressing something in the tactics board, which I would do at half time every, every game, can everyone see where I am? You know, can everyone see the board? You know, as long as everyone can see what's going on, as long as everyone is understanding what's going on. And you might just, say for example, you get a smell that you think, you know, young John in the corner there is just not that switched on. John? Happy enough with everything. Two key points. What's our two key points? Perfect. Brilliant. Happy days. You know, and, and that's just a simple, discreet way of going about it, Shane, you know. Um, but listen, I, I was fortunate, obviously, uh, to, to work with, with Bernard uh, at, at the Dragons when he was at the Dragons at the time, Bernard Jackman. And it was brilliant, Shane, because I went down to Ravenhill with him. And I was in the, I was in the uh, hotel about four or five hours before the game. Went to the pre-match meal three hours before the game went to the pre-match meeting and then I carried the water for them uh, out in the pitch for the warm-up in the change rooms at half-time. Phenomenal experience to see that. But here's an interesting one for you and, and I know a club, a certain club in Down do it as well is that they have a, they have a, they have a, a horrible environment for the away team in Ravenhill. So what happens is in the Ravenhill home change rooms you have an oval circle where everyone can see the manager. The manager can stand and have everyone in attention and can see everyone and is in control of the room. In the away change rooms, it's shaped nearly like a like a like a like an L shape, you know, and it's a little smaller and it's a little more condensed. And you have to look around corners to try and see everyone. And you know, it, it's a psychological one. It's a psychological one, you know. And and uh, I know Glenn and, and down like John Kennedy was a great man, a great friend of mine. John was manager down there for eight years and used to go to Glen when it was like a wee shoebox to put you into. And in the middle of summer, they had the heat full on, you know. So we decided at halftime we'd stay out onto the field and, uh, to do our halftime team talk, you know. But it was, uh, you know, it's it, it, that, that can that can impact your talk to the environment as well. And I think that's why it's important that, you know, you can you can see everyone at halftime. If people are moving about at halftime and shifting about and you're trying to talk and people are moving and there's noise and studs, it's very disruptive, you know. But the halftime team talk with Bernard was very interesting because they broke into smaller groups. It was player-led initially. Then the coaches came in and showed clips on the iPad of what went well, what went wrong. And then Bernard would have finished with a concluding point, you know, and, and refocused them in a general type of view, you know. So it was an interesting environment. And one of the biggest changes, Shane, I've probably seen from that in comparison to, to our sport was the level of analysis. I think the level of analysis was at a different level, you know. And obviously management teams have an awful lot to juggle at halftime and we've gone through a lot of that. Then you've obviously got the players that you may or may not use. Um, <laughs> so I would have always been a very frustrated substitute whenever it would have happened to me. So I kind of almost insisted that we do serious drills at half time, you know, to, because this idea of going in and sitting with the rest of the team as they're relaxing at half time, you don't need that downtime. You actually need to get match ready. You need to do that warm up that we've talked about that maybe teams would, would do before they come out for the second half. But how do you balance that idea of getting a substitute ready, both mentally and, and physically ready at half time to throw them out to help make some of those changes for the second half? Well, the greatest, the greatest substitute, I'll answer your questions in a second, but we'll, we'll lead in with this. The greatest substitute of all time, the greatest substitute of all time, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer. Okay, there was no better substitute in the world, in world sport. The amount of games that he came on and influenced and changed and, you know, even go back to 99 where he scored the winner in the Champions League final. But, like, I will never forget reading an article where he talked about while other players might switch off as a substitute, I studied the game. Maybe that's why, you know, when people might argue he's not a good manager, but maybe that's why he has made management at the top level because, you know, he had that hat on, he had that thought on. But he said, I studied the game. 
I look for weaknesses in the opposition. I look for areas I'll be coming on to. I look for what parts of the opposition I can expose. How many players are sitting watching the game, looking at the corner forward, thinking, I could be marking him. What foot's he kicking off? What side is he turning to? And these are things I say to players. If you're a substitute, where will you be coming on? Because let's be honest, technically 80, 90% of the time, they'll know where they're coming into the game. You know, they'll know what position they're coming into. And you're saying, right, if you're a wing back, you know, look at areas that you can exploit. You know, if you're a midfielder, watch his runs. You know, if you're a corner back, track the forward runs. You know, watch the game, Shane. I think that's vitally important that you drill that into substitutes. And what you need to do, Shane, is you need to create a culture. You need to create a culture within the group and a culture within the club. Because if your culture at half time is to cross the ball in and head it into the net and play headers and volleys, which you see up and down the country, and you might laugh, you see it at a bloody senior level in, in, in club football, where boys are out pucking about, they're kicking about, and they're having a laugh and they're joking about. For me, half time has to be structured. Totally agree with you. And it's something that we would have done at, at Ballyholan quite a bit, and we would have done it at Parlow. The SNC coach stayed out with the players, and they'd done five, six minutes of a dynamic warm up just to keep themselves going during that time, because that, for me, set them in a really good tone. It put them in a good mental way. So if we were making a change at half time, say you were coming on at half time, as I was coming off, I'd say to you, Shane, get your three or four minutes done and then get into the change rooms. So by the time you got into the change rooms, the review and the reflect and the refocus hadn't started. The players were only relaxing and refueling. And you were coming in ready to listen what your role was and then obviously go out and perform in the second half. You know, So I think it's vitally important that you manage that as well. And that's part of managing half time. And again, Shane, what probably helps there is a management team. When you have a good management team that you can trust and you have players that are, you have, sorry, you surround yourself with good people, you can do that. Probably more difficult at club level because you maybe don't have the access to the numbers. You don't have the access to the personnel. You know, you're relying on good club people within the club to help you and stuff like that, you know. But I'm, I'm you know, a massive believer that that halftime period is just as important for the substitutes to warm up mentally and physically as it is for the team inside. Mm. And have a little word for Kevin McManaman as well, who might also be oh, the, the hey, substitute. Hey, hey. Oh, man. In her own game, absolutely. Like, Jesus, you know. And listen, I go back to 2010. I go back to 2010 when Down got the all final. And the only reason I'm referencing Down is because I, I, I was there and I know that, you know, how how, uh, how effective these guys were. But I think of some of the substitutes that were coming on, you know, the likes of Ronan Murder, for example. Like, Ronnie came on against Sligo and scored 1-5 in about 15 minutes, you know. And, and he knew that that was his role. Come on again, Kerry, and kick three points in the quarterfinal. You know, he knew that that was his role. And he had himself psychologically and mentally prepared that I'm coming into this game and I'm making an impact. You know, and I think that when you've got a player who can accept that, and that's a big thing. Like McManaman, I'm sure, you know, it's probably easier for McManaman to accept that, you know, in, in such a, a high performance setup like Dublin, where he knows he's going to be going home with three or four medals anyway, you know. So it's maybe not as easy for a, for a player to accept that in another team, you know, and, and that's that's the key thing. I tell you the truth, Shane, I'm going to be honest, and, and, and I know we're running on a bit, but like, I actually think of, of 2018 McCarlow will be a successful year, and I genuinely believe that, that a lot of it was down to the players we were bringing in. You know, we were bringing guys in who were fresh and who also had a lot of pace, you know, like Cian Lawler and Danny Moore and guys like that who came into games and who added a freshness, but added pace as well when teams were getting stretched, you know, and I think that that was vitally important. And then you lose a lot of those guys due to some of them went to the army, some of them decided to step away, some of them were injured, you know, and it, and it, it has a big impact on you. So you do need your, your players, you know, physically and mentally ready to come into the game. Really brilliant stuff, Stephen. Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll do another video again. Enjoyed it, Shane. Thank you.